So a common question that I get from a lot of my students is when do you use which derivative test? And that's a really good question, right? Because the first and second derivative tests, they have slightly different mechanisms, but they actually tell us the same thing. So sometimes it can be pretty confusing as to choose one test over another, especially if you're not given a lot of um, rigid guidelines in whatever, whatever context you're working these problems in. Right? So in this video, I'm just going to sort of give you some pointers on how you might decide which test to use. And then we'll do some practice problems just to sort of drive home some of these ideas. Okay, so let's get started. So the first thing I really want to uh, bring home here is that both tests are equally correct to use, right? So both tests are perfectly legitimate. So what I'm going to tell you is like some situations in which one test is easier to use than another, where one, using one test will save you a lot of calculations, but ultimately both tests will give you the right answer, right? So both tests are valid methods. You can use whichever one you're comfortable with. Uh, what I'm telling you is more like guidelines as opposed to like um, sort of rigid, rigid uh, principles. However, there are two exceptions, right? There's two exceptions you should know. These exceptions are the first thing is when your first derivative were f prime of c. Of course, c, if you remember, is our critical point, right? And so when f prime of c is undefined, that's the first thing. It's undefined, right? Because if you remember, the definition of a critical point does allow our first derivative to be undefined at that point, provided if the, this point is still within the domain of our original function. So therefore, this is definitely, uh, this could definitely happen. And in this case, you actually can't use the second derivative test because uh, you can't take a second derivative there. So therefore, this, um, this the second derivative test does not really work there. So in this case, you really have to use the first derivative test. The second thing is when f double prime of c, again, at that same critical point, equals zero. Because again, that's one of the places where it tells us that the second derivative test breaks down. So we really have to use the first derivative test in both of these cases. So those are the two hard restrictions to what I'm about to tell you. Right? So let's get started. All right, so let's talk about when it's easier to use the first derivative test as opposed to the second, right? So the first one is when f double prime of x is very difficult. It's very difficult to calculate. So this occurs sometimes when you have like, you know, rational functions, or if you have, um, what's this, if you have to do a lot of product rules, if you're doing a lot of chain rules, if you're doing some kind of implicit differentiation, it can sometimes be very tedious to find that second derivative, right? So therefore, if you need to find, if finding that second derivative is very tedious, you might as well stop at the first derivative and just do your work over there instead of wasting time plugging, trying to find that second derivative, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is when the second derivative test breaks down. So again, this is basically what we talked about in the previous slide, right? When the second derivative test breaks down, those two cases we discussed in the previous slide, this, out of everything in this list, this is the only thing that I think is a very rigid guideline. So if the second derivative test breaks down, you pretty much have to use the first derivative test, right? Um, that's that. The next thing is when your critical points are very ugly, when they're just not nice numbers. An example of this is something like, I don't know, like the square root of pi plus 2 over, I don't know, e to the 7th or something like that. That's just a very nasty number to work with, right? It's, it would be hard to plug into any kind of function, and it's just a pain in the butt to really do anything with. So once you have something like this, you might want to consider the first derivative test, right? Because remember, the first derivative test doesn't actually do anything, doesn't do a whole lot with that number itself. Instead, you're looking at what the first derivative does around that number. So we draw that number line, we put our critical point over here, and then we test numbers here, and we test numbers here. And you can artificially pick these numbers to be much, to be pretty nice. And you can avoid having to interact with that at all. As opposed to with the second derivative test, you would actually have to plug that guy into your second derivative, which can make things a little messy, right? So those are some situations in which I think the first derivative test would be easier. Again, bear in mind, this list is not exhaustive. There's a lot of other potential situations. These are just ones that came to mind, right? What about the second derivative test? Well, this have, first thing is when higher order derivatives are simpler, right? When taking more derivatives uh, gives you simpler functions. An example of this would be a uh, polynomial. Right? For example, when the first when f of x is a polynomial, right? For example, x to the fifth. When you take more derivatives of that using the power rule, you're gradually creating a more simple function, right? So that's why the um, 
in this particular case, in, th in this kind of a case, using a second derivative test would actually be nicer because you have, um, your end result will be a much simpler function so you can, it's a lot easier to work with that. The next thing is when your critical points are nice, right, as opposed to, to this guy right here. So when your critical points are nice, right, all you have to do is plug them into your second derivative, right? And if they're nice numbers, they will work well with your function. So um, some examples of this, you know, would be like, it's like zero, it's a bad zero, but zero, one, things like that. Those are very easy to plug into any kind of function. And so it'll make your life a lot um, easier. So you can, so it'll make doing the second derivative test a lot quicker, as opposed to with the first derivative test, even though those numbers are nice, you still have to actually plug in numbers around that, around these nice numbers. So it would, you could just save yourself some time, take the second derivative, plop these numbers in there, hopefully it'll turn out pretty nice, right? The last one here is when f prime of x and f double prime of x are of equal complexity. The reason I'm saying this is because if it's about similar difficulty to plug into your first derivative versus your second derivative, it might have, you might as well do this because with your with your first derivative test again right you have to plug in a point here and plug in a point here around that individual critical point whereas with your second derivative test we're just taking our second derivative right and then we're just plopping in these critical points in here we don't need to test any values around those critical points so if the first and second derivative are about the same difficulty to plug these numbers into you might as well take your second derivative plug the critical points straight into them it's a little it's a little bit less work so once again just a little disclaimer here these are not like rigorous guy rigorous rules they're more just like guidelines you're welcome to you're welcome to choose whichever test you want again this is the only one that i i want to say you sh you have to follow right but apart from that everything else is just guidelines um, use them well of course there are situations when even these will not entirely overlap so there are functions where the second derivative is very difficult but you might get nice critical points so use your judgment there just um, to choose what, what test to use, right? Um, but these are some things you can follow. So now let's do some examples so we can really uh, take the, uh, nail this stuff home, right? So we wanna find and verify all our extreme values for this, this function right here, okay? f of x equals x, cubed, x squared minus 6x plus one. So let's go ahead and start the way we normally do. So the first thing, of course, that we are going to do is we are going to find our find our critical points. Right, we want to find our critical points. To do this, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our first derivative, which in this case we're just going to use a power rule here. Right? And if you do that, you will get uh, you'll get f of f prime of x equals two x minus six. We're going to set that guy equal to zero. So now it's just a little algebra. We're going to push the 6 over to that side, divide by 2. We're going to get x equals 3 at our critical point. Okay? Nothing new so far. Now, here's when we need to think a little bit more. Which test now can we use to verify that this is in fact a local min, max, or none of the above? Well, if you, if you think back to the guidelines we talked about, this is a polynomial, right? So it's actually getting simpler. Like the first derivative is, the, as we take more derivatives, this function's actually get, it's actually gonna get simpler. The higher order derivative, derivatives are gonna get simpler. So therefore, I'm actually gonna go ahead and use my second derivative test. So I'm gonna use my second, I'm gonna use my second derivative test. And you'll see why in just a second. You'll see exactly why in just a second here. But I'm gonna use my second derivative test. So if I take my second derivative, Right. Take my second derivative. I'm just going to get two. That's my final answer. Now that number is not even dependent on x. Right. It's just a constant. So regardless of what value of x I plug in, I know my second derivative is going to be just two. And two is greater than zero. Right. It's greater than zero. So therefore, our conclusion is that we have a min. At x equals two, as at x equals three, and we know that just because this first derivative is 
positive. Like we didn't even have to plug in x equals three. We just knew it's positive for any value of x. So that made life very, very nice for us. So we just said we that's true for so that so therefore we know that we have a min there. Okay. So that's that's the first example there. Alright, so here's another example. Let's talk about it. So the first thing is going to be this first step is going to be the same as always. So we're going to find our critical points. Yeah. So we're going to do this by taking our first derivative and setting it equal to zero. And in this case, our first derivative uh, will. So first term is going to be cosine of x because derivative of sine is cosine. So we have cosine of x minus root three over two. And we're going to set that equal to zero. Push the root three over two to that side. We have cosine of x equals root three over two. Now you will need to use a little bit of your unit circle here to remember what value of x satisfies that equation. But as it turns out, it's going to be, as it turns out, there's two values of x that you get. Um, and you get x equals pi over six and 11 pi over six. If you did not get that or you're struggling with the unit circle, I have a whole another video on the unit circle in my pre-calculus section. So you're welcome to check that out. And it is pretty important for Calc 1, so I would really make sure you, you know that well. But anyways, let's move on. Now, take a second now and think about what test would be best to use here. Take a second and think about it. Well, I'm actually going to go for second derivative test. I'm going to go for my second derivative test. So let me stress though, let me stress again, first derivative test is also okay. It is correct. It is correct to use the first derivative test here. It's not, in my opinion, it's not the best way, but it is not incorrect to use the first derivative test here. I want to stress that again because it is also a valid method i just think second derivative is easier in this case and you i'll explain why in a second here but the first derivative test is also fine just uh, don't forget that right just because i chose the second derivative test does not mean it's incorrect to use the first derivative test right so we take our second derivative and derivative of cosine is negative sine so we have a negative sine of x as our second derivative now let's plug in our critical points. And now here we come to the reason as to why the second derivative test works nicer here, because notice our second derivative is a trig function, and those angles are very nice angles to plug into a trig function, right? So it just, it works out very nicely for us in that way. So we don't need to, we can just plug in these straight into our function. We don't need to worry about drawing a number line and plugging angles um, in the different sides of this. So it just works out a lot nicer here for us, right? So f double prime of pi over 6 is going to be negative sine of pi over 6, which is that. And sine of pi over 6, if you remember, is just 1, is one half. So this would be negative 1 half. Again, I'm not so interested in that particular number itself, but I am interested that it's less than 0. A negative number and because of that using the second derivative test I can conclude that I have a I have a max at x equals pi over 6 I can go ahead and write that conclusion out okay all right now let's look at the other point I plug in 11 pi over 6, okay, I will get negative sine of 11 pi over 6. And 11 pi over 6 has the same magnitude as the units as sine, like 11, sine of 11 pi over 6 and sine of pi over 6 have the same magnitude. But however, since we're looking in this quadrant of the unit circle right now, it's going to be negative. So this, this piece right here, it's actually going to be a negative one half. And then we multiply the negative one after that. So we actually end up with a positive one half. And 
Once again, I am not nearly as interested in that number itself as I am in the fact that it is greater than zero. And so based off this, I can make the conclusion that I have a min at x equals 11 pi. Let's make that a little nicer. 11 pi over 6. Cool. So that's basically how we do this problem. Okay, so here's another guy here. So let's talk about this one. So once again, our first step is always going to be to find our critical points. Okay. And as always, we do that by taking our first derivative, and we want to set that equal to zero. Now the first derivative here is going to involve a product rule. Okay, because we have a multiplication of functions. If you're still struggling with the product rule, remember I have another video on that. You're welcome to check that out. I'm just going to rush through it a little bit here. But if we do that, we get the first derivative of x times e to the x. That's just going to be e to the x times 1. And then we add x times the derivative of e to the x, which is just going to be x e to the x. Okay, We want to set that guy equal to 0. Now initially that looks a little bit daunting, but Look at this. We can actually factor out an e to the x from everything. So we get e to the x times 1 plus x equals 0. So now we can use our zero product property, set each of these terms equal to 0, and see what we get. However, note that e to the x is never equal to 0. It's just a property of exponential functions that they never come out to 0. So therefore, I don't even need to worry about setting that equal to 0. I'm just going to go ahead and set this guy equal to 0. I'm going to set that guy equal to 0. And so if we do that, we get 1 plus x equals 0. x equals negative 1. So that will be our only critical point here. Right? Now, our next step will be to choose what test to use. Once again, I'll let you take a second and work out and fi or figure out what test might be easier to use here. I'm actually going to go for first derivative test here. Right? I'm actually going to go for my first derivative test here. The reason for that is because notice if I do a product rule, I would have another product rule here if I wanted to take a second derivative, right? So I would have to do product rule again and that would that would lead to a couple that would lead to a slightly longer polynomial to work with okay it would still not strict be strictly difficult but it would be a little bit of a, a little bit of a hassle right so therefore i'm using my first derivative second derivative once again is not wrong but i'm just choosing this out of preference right so we're gonna draw a little number line here right drop negative one in the middle there and now we're going to test a point to the left and test a point to the right. So what's a nice number? What's a number to the left? So what's a number to the left here that we can test? Well, I'm just going to test some really big negative number. So let's try f prime of negative 10. Right? So if I plug in negative 10 into e of the x, I will get e to the negative 10, which is still a positive number, bear in mind. It's just small. And then we get 1 minus 10. This is actually, again, I don't even really care what value, what number that comes out to, but it's going to be less than zero, right? Because that's a positive number, that's a negative number, so this is going to be less than zero. So I'm going to put a big negative sign over there. Okay? Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take the first derivative, and we're going to plug in a value to the right of negative 1, and a nice thing for that would just be zero, right? So if we plug in zero, we get e to the zero times one plus zero. e to the zero is just one, so this actually just comes out to positive one. And once again, like the, the fact that it comes out to one is way less interesting to me than the fact that it's a positive number, right? So we're gonna put a little plus sign there. And now 
Notice here that we switch from plus to minus, right? So given this, we can conclude that because we switch from plus to minus, we have a, or sorry, we switch from minus to plus, my apologies there, because we switch from minus to plus, we know that this must be a min. X equals minus. Let's draw that nicer. X equals minus 1. Okay? That's how we work this out. Once again, we could have used second derivative test. This just turns out to be a little nicer because we don't have to take a we don't have to do another product rule. Let's move on. All right, so this will be the last example that we talk about today, but the steps are still the same. So the first thing we want to do is we want to find our critical points, right? So we do that by taking our first derivative, setting it equal to zero. So the derivative of L, so here we're actually going to have to use a chain rule. Right. I hope you I hope you saw that even before I said it, but we will have to use a chain rule because we have a natural log on the outside here, and inside we have this big x squared plus one here. So we will have to use a chain rule there. So derivative of the outside function, everything stuck inside, it's going to be one over x squared plus one, right? And then we tack on the deriv derivative of the inside, which is just going to be a two x, right? So that's our derivative. We want to set that equal to zero. So let's, if we, so if we're setting this equal to zero, we multiply by the denominator on both sides. So we end up with two x equals zero and x equals zero as our, as our, as one of our critical points. Now you might also ask the question, aren't critical points also you, also defined as places where the first derivative is undefined? That's absolutely right. So therefore we would actually also have to check to see where that equals zero, right? So we'd have to say x squared plus one equals zero because we're trying to figure out where f prime of x is undefined. Let's actually make a quick, quick note of that. So this would be where f prime of x is undefined, right? So therefore, so first thing we do is we subtract one. So we have x squared equals minus one. Now we can take the square root of both sides and you will already see at this point that there is something very wrong with this, right? We have plus or minus the square root of minus one, which is a complex number, which is not good for us in this class. So therefore, this just doesn't work for us. So we can just go ahead and say, that's our only critical point. So this just, we don't even need to care about it. So f prime of x is defined everywhere, so x equals zero is our only critical point. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about what test we could use. Right. Take another second. Think about what test might be good to use. I'm actually going to go with first derivative this time as well. And do you see why? Well, the reason why is because when I take that first derivative, now I have a quotient up here. Right, I have a quotient. And to take another derivative of that, I need to use quotient rule, which is a bit of a pain. So to avoid that and save myself the trouble, I'm just going, going to go ahead and stick with my first derivative test. Second derivative test also would work. I think it would actually would not be as bad in this case as well. But first derivative, in my opinion, is a little easier. All right. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's put our trusty old number line here. So we have a critical point there. And now let's test our intervals. So let's see what happens if I plug in something like this. Let's try negative one as our first critical point. So my numerator, my denominator, I hope, I mean, my denominator is always gonna be positive if you, if you see that. Because x squared plus one cannot equal zero and therefore cannot equal any, and cannot equal zero to begin with, and it would definitely not be able, it would not equal any negative number if you if you tried working that equation out. I'll let you try that out. But basically, 
the sign of my first derivative will depend exclusively on what's in the numerator, right? So when I plug in negative one, I get negative, I get two times minus one over some positive number. And so this is going to be less than zero. Right? So I'm gonna draw a little minus sign there. Now, to the right here, I'm gonna plug in one. Once again, I will have two times one. I'm still dividing by a positive number, so that will stay the same. And so this die right here is just gonna be greater than zero. So I'll put a plus sign there. Okay. So given this, we can now conclude that we have, once again, since we go from negative to positive, we have a min at x equals zero. And that's it. So that's all the examples I have for you today. Once again, I hope this was helpful and I hope this kind of showed you a little bit of, I hope this kind of answered that question of where you can use one derivative test versus another. Again, I hope I've, I've tried to provide what intuition I can. The best way to do this is just to pr through practice, but I hope the intuition was helpful. If you found this video helpful, please do like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, and check out some other videos. See you next time.